have, all of us at some point or another have had this philosophical question, um, are we alone in the universe? And scientists are, have figured out that space is an enormous, the universe is an enormous place. Uh, we're not likely, probably in our lifetime, to run into any of these type A personalities that I have. Okay. Um, but at the same time, we're realizing that um, there are organisms called extremophiles that can exist at very exotic uh, temperatures and pressures and conditions. And so our solar system may be teeming uh, with, with simple biology, simple organisms. So this is a great quote from uh, Obama's uh, chief scientist at NASA, Ellen Stofan, and that basically, she said this two years ago, that we're going to find life within 20 to 30 years. Within our lifetime, we will find life outside of our planet. Uh, we know where to look, we know how to look, we have the technology, and we're on a path to implementing it. And that's pretty exciting. All right. So, uh, so before we think about the biology of space, uh, really there are hundreds of years worth of unanswered questions in the chemistry of space. So how do we go from uh, these specks of dust and specks of water uh, to these simple organisms to uh, people like you and me, right? right? And so there are molecules in space, but uh, in we didn't even know this until the late 1960s. Before this, we thought that there was no astrochemistry, there was no astrobiology. We only thought that there was astrophysics because there's so much ultraviolet and X-ray radiation and gamma rays in space that before the 70s, people thought that this radiation just blew apart any chance of there being molecules into their atoms and their charged atoms. And so there were no molecules, there were just atoms. But then uh, Alexander Delgado in the late 60s and early 70s uh, was kind of a pioneer in realizing that uh, when stars are early on in their life, they have these gigantic clouds of material around them. And these clouds have tons of uh, grains and dust and ice and, and different chemicals. And these actually buffer uh, all of this radiation. And so inside these clouds, you have tons of exotic molecular material. So in the Sagittarius constellation, for example, there's this tiny little spot of this whole huge cloud uh, where 50% of all of the molecules directly discovered in space uh, have been found here. And so that tiny part of this cloud has 300 billion times the mass of our sun. Right? But it's huge, and it's there's a lot of stuff in there, but it's also really cold. Right? So we know stars, the temperature of a star is, in the, is many thousands of degrees. But in these clouds, it can be down to negative 400 degrees. So what happens is that everything is a gas, uh, Certain things are in their gas form, and so they are very cold, and these molecules go <laughs> run into other molecules, whereas on Earth, they would collide with the air, with molecules in the air, and they would be very reactive, and they would turn into kind of more typical uh, terrestrial molecules, right? So do these uh, exotic molecules in space uh, kind of uh, aggregate and turn into the precursors of biology? So this is a list of the 164 known molecules that have been observed in this dust. And okay, so uh, these are all tiny little fragments of the molecules that are important in terms of biology and uh, pharma, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the petroleum industry. And, uh, and so these are all these tiny little chunks of, of what makes up life, sugars, carbohydrates, um, lipids, uh, Things like that. So, um, so yeah, 164. But we know on Earth of 120 different mo million molecules on our planet. There's 85, at least 85,000 molecules that are manufactured just in the United States right now. So, this is a very uh, pathetic subset of of all of chemistry, right? And so, the question that I want to answer in my lab is: When does astrochemistry become astrobiology? And the answer is very sad. Um, well, it's very sad. We're not close to knowing uh, because these frag we don't know how these fragments build up into the, com the complex machinery that we have in our bodies, right? So we're very slowly learning about this dust in, in space and how molecular complexities increase. 
Um, but luckily, this huge knowledge gap means that uh, I will be in business for uh, <laughs> until I'm buried in the ground, right? And specifically in my lab, the role is, what is the role of inorganic chemistry in space? How do metals um, influence uh, this buildup of complexity? And how, does, how do metals kind of help us get towards uh, the origin of life? And so in our bodies, we have these proteins, these huge molecules, right? And, and we need metals like iron and zinc and copper and calcium. But we also need some, some of the weirder metals like manganese and vanadium and molybdenum to survive, right? So this is the, this is the biological machinery. These are bioinorganic uh, proteins. But now if we list the, uh, if we think about the complexity of, mo of bioinorganic molecules in space, uh, it's really lame, right? We have these tiny molecules with three atoms that uh, are, don't at all resemble biology and biochemistry, right? So, unlike everybody else, I think I'm mostly going to talk about myself. <laughs> uh, here I am uh, as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Um, I didn't work very hard. I didn't study very hard. I didn't party very hard, right? So, if I am between 19 and 21 years old in this picture, that is not a beer, that's like a Mountain Dew Coke, right? <laughs> right. So I didn't, know, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, right, at all. Uh, until one day we had a visiting uh, we had a visiting speaker in the chemistry department, this guy, Daniel Crawford. And so he was a faculty candidate. He was interviewing at University of Michigan and deciding whether or not he wanted to be a chemistry professor there. And he gave a talk about structure and energetics of isomers of the interstellar molecule C5H, uh, which sounds very dry. Uh, but then he started talking about how he used computers uh, to study a molecule that had never been made on Earth and had never been observed in space, but people thought that it might exist in space. So his computer simulations were going to help people find this molecule in space and then make it in their labs on Earth. So he combined computers, math, physics, chemistry, uh, and I was like, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. This is, this is like the combination of everything geeky that I love. <laughs> so I said, okay, I want to go to, I thought I wanted to be a teacher, so I said, okay, I want to go to grad school, and I want to do research with one of the people who wrote this paper, right? So I wanted to go, so I hope that Daniel Crawford would accept the position at the University of Michigan, but he didn't accept the Michigan's offer. He ended up at Virginia Tech, but when I was applying for grad school, he hadn't set up his lab or his website yet, so I had no idea where the heck he ended up, so I could never find him. We're friends now, but uh, I never got to go to grad school and work for him. So I did the next best thing, which was work for his boss, where he got his PhD, uh, Fritz Schaefer at the University of Georgia in Athens. Right. I also thought about working for John Stanton, uh, but the uh, University of Texas, where he was, was the only graduate school that I applied to out of, out of six that rejected me. <laughs> uh, and Jamal was just a grad, uh, grad student at the time, so I couldn't go work for him. He's incredibly successful in the pharmaceutical industry now. So I ended up at Georgia in this enormous lab of fridge shavers, um, just a small fish in a big pond, and I started my work. And so I, you know, the day I showed up, I was assigned my first project, uh, which was to do computer simulations uh, based on a publication uh, by Paul Dagdigian, and he's a he's a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. And so uh, there were a couple people that were encouraging my my PhD advisor to have somebody in his lab work on this project because there were a number of very weird, uh, sloppy things in this paper. <coughs> Uh, and so the more we dug into this research, the more we realized that things didn't add up. And particularly that the first author, who is the postdoctoral researcher of, of Professor Dagdigian, had his name spelled wrong on his publication. So I don't know if, it, if any of you have a publication that is out in the literature for the rest of history, if your name is spelled wrong on that paper, uh, uh, age, age, yeah. And, Right, so I would never let uh, something like that happen to me, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the space in which we the capital Y is that like, it doesn't show up in search engines if you look for my name. So, okay. Uh, me and Hamdu are still friends. Um, so this is my first project in grad school to uh, work on this molecule, FENC, iron isocyanide, 
and to look at its uh, kind of its, its twin uh, or its sibling, uh, FECN, iron cyanide. And so my PhD advisor said, this is going to be easy. It's going to take you like three months. Uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be great. Um, it did not take me three months. It took me my first three years of grad school. Uh, all of the growing up that I didn't do as an undergrad, I had to do in grad school, right? And so, and my advisor had severely underestimated the challenge, the technological hurdles, and the challenge uh, that this project, uh, that I faced with this project. All right, so, so my boss has this quote: uh, "Don't get the right answer for the wrong reason." So, with uh, computational chemistry, you can fuss around with your models and your algorithms, your mathematics, and you can get can have the computer tell you what you want to hear, right? And so that's not really progress in science. Uh, but when I finally published <coughs> this paper, my results were very different from this lab at Johns Hopkins. And so there were really only two, uh, two options for this, for this paper. One is that I was right, and this well-established uh, physical chemist at Johns Hopkins was wrong, right? And so uh, the, you know, the newbie was you know, I didn't want to get too ahead of myself. Or the reason that my results were differing from his were that uh, that the technology hadn't advanced enough, and, and we needed. And I had sort of recognized some technological deficiencies in the methods that I used that needed to be improved upon. So that's not very typical in the published literature. So I, you know, so I kind of bragged about this. I, I got the wrong answer for the right reason. Uh, okay, so I graduated. I got my PhD. Uh, which is great. Um, and then I moved on to uh, postdoctoral work uh, and research at the University of Memphis. I've done a lot of things that I'm really proud of, really exciting in inorganic chemistry and biochemistry, uh, environmental chemistry. All right. So, but my still my first love in research is astrochemistry, looking at molecules in space. And so, in January. Uh, this amazing summer undergraduate researcher that I had in my lab, she's now at grad school at the University of South Carolina, Shelby, uh, she took the lead on this project and we published this paper in the International Journal of Quantum Chemistry, and so it was the featured cover article for their second issue in January. Um, and so we looked at seven molecules that have never been made on Earth and never been observed in space, but we think that they're out there, uh, so our data can encourage people to go look for these molecules and discover them to see how they interact with all of these pieces of life out there, right? A missing thread to my entire career uh, that I haven't talked about yet is, uh, is Lucy Zuris at the University of Arizona. So she's a chemistry and astronomy professor at Arizona. Um, like me, she's one of the only inorganic astrochemists in the world. She's my chemistry hero. I have so many stories of her um, talking trash and sticking up for me and sticking up for herself, and, and she's been a really amazing mentor and collaborator. And so she's actually the one that pointed out to my PhD advisor that that paper did not look right at all, and somebody needed to, to do some simulations. And so the Zurich group, uh, they make molecules in their lab that are the first people on Earth to ever make a molecule, and then they go to their radio telescope, and they try to find the signatures of these molecules in space. So it's pretty neat. Um, and so then, after 10 years of work in her lab, uh, her amazing graduate students, Lindsay Zack and Mike Flory, actually find, they finally made these molecules in their lab, and then they went to the telescope and they found, not FEMC, but FECN in space. So now, uh, iron cyanide, FECN, that's the first known metal carbon bond uh, in the interstellar medium, in the clouds around stars. Um, so that was a big deal, and it turns out that my that I wasn't wrong for the right reason, I was, I was right. And so uh, a lot of people uh, were not fond of my initial research, but it turned out that I had the right answer. So, uh, so now me and uh, Professor Zuris have this great collaboration, and uh, we have trust, right? So I'm very happy to be a scientist, very happy to be at the University of Memphis, uh, and I'm doing all this work. I, 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 I am building this bridge between people who do simulations on computers and people who actually make these molecules in the lab. Um, and so doing a lot of work trying to increase the known molecular complexity in space and bridging this gap between chemistry and biology in space. So this is my amazing lab, uh, all these students helping me with my research and bringing great ideas. 
uh, and then the amazing mentors and nice bosses and friends that I've had throughout my career. Ashley's not on here. Thank you, Ashley, for inviting me. And, and thank you, everyone, for letting me talk about it.